Indigenous Rights Radio, because knowledge is power. It's such a great pleasure to talk to you. I'm always encouraged and motivated when I see what you do on social media and the interest that you show in environment and matters that the government is not even considering. So thanks for what you do. Yeah, thank you very much. I really appreciate the comment. I'm humbled by it. David, as you know, I try to get my head around the Just Energy Transition Plan of government simply because yes. we have an obligation to inform, but before we inform, we must understand. Yes. Can you please just introduce yourself to our listeners, give a little of your background, as much as possible probably, and then just explain the Just Energy Transition Plan of the South African government. My name is David van Beek. I'm the lead researcher with the Benchmarks Foundation. The Benchmarks Foundation is associated with the South African Council of Churches, and it was created by Desmond Tutu, um, or launched by Desmond Tutu, with the purpose of looking at uh, corporate social responsibility in South Africa post-apartheid, to see whether my companies uh, behave better after apartheid than what they did during apartheid, and whether they are responsible to the country and its people, or whether they are just interested in making a big profit. Uh, I've been doing this work for 20 years. Most of our focus has been on mining. <clears throat> um, reason being that about 45% of South Africa's exports are mineral-related, and many of its imports, uh, almost half of its imports, are also related to mining. And um, we are in interesting times because mining is in steep decline, despite what the Minister of Minerals and Energy is saying. Uh, minerals are not renewable, and so, uh, you know, the minerals that are available are becoming fewer and fewer because we are mining and export exporting them at an alarming rate. So many of our gold mines have closed down and many of the large-scale mining companies have left the country already, PHP Britain, Anglo Gold, Ashanti. And we see at the moment uh, in the takeover bit by PHP Bulletin of Anglo that Anglo itself seems to be disintegrating before our eyes. Now, we are also concerned with energy issues because coal mining has a severe impact on the environment. It has a severe impact on people's constitutional right to a health and safe, say, healthy and safe environment. And, you know, it has a, a, a severe impact on our river system and water and water quality and air quality and so on as well. Now, to come to the question of a just transition, I think that it's important that um, we go beyond the limited view of government regarding a just transition. And it shouldn't just be a just transition in energy. It should also be a just transition in the economy because we need to move our economy beyond mining. We need to step up a level in our economy because uh, many mining towns are busy dying because the minerals are running out or the minerals are no longer profitable to mine. So, for example... Uh, the platinum mining industry was based on catalytic converters. 90% of platinum was used to, to catalytic converters for petrol engines or diesel engines to reduce the lead uh, pollution that comes from those engines' exhaust systems. And so as we are moving now towards electric engines for motor vehicles and, 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 and transport and so on, uh, we find that there's no longer a demand for platinum. And so the platinum price has never recovered since 2009, and many platinum mines are now also busy closing down. Um, interesting to note that when BHP Billiton made a bid for Anglo-American, it did not want the platinum mines, it did not want the diamond mines. And Glencore also made a bid for, um, for, for Anglo, and uh, it did not want the diamond mines either. Now, when we talk about the just transition, we need to talk about all these dying mining towns. What is what is going to happen to all the employees that are being retrenched? And thousands of people are being retrenched as we speak uh, on the platinum platinum mine fields in the gold mining industry, 
uh, and so on. Uh, interestingly, coal mining uh, is experiencing a huge revival, copper mining as well. So coal mining, because the Europeans are importing huge quantities of coal from South Africa now, uh, given that they have imposed sanctions on Russia, which was the usual supplier of coal. And um, the other thing, of course, is that South Africa uh, – as copper mines, the copper mines are now being revived because the copper price has increased dramatically since 7 October uh, 2023, um, since the attack by the uh, Israelis on, on Palestine. And so we are having a situation where uh, the demand for copper has rapidly increased, A, because copper is used in bullets, um, and every Palestinian child that gets killed by a bullet gets killed by a bullet that is covered in or clad in plat uh, clad in copper. Um, and of course, then the transition to alternative energy relies a lot on copper. You know, every electrical device has copper wiring in it. You know, copper is a very very important industrial uh, mineral, as is uh, iron as well. Um, so. Uh, when we talk about a just transition, then for me, it means two things. It means a transition beyond mining towards a manufacturing economy, a higher level economy than just mining. And secondly, it involves uh, doing something with mining towns that are dying. Okay, so you have uh, all these gold mining towns that are dying. Johannesburg, the city itself is busy dying at the moment. Uh, Valcom is dying, Orkney is dying, uh, Stilfontein is dying, Klerksdorp is dying, Kaltenville is dying. All these towns where you used to have gold mines are dying. And the platinum mining towns, Burgersport, uh, Rustenburg and so on, are also in steep decline as a result of the change in mineral demand globally uh, as we move towards alternative energy. Now, I don't talk about green energy. There's nothing like green energy because any energy that is generated from minerals can't be green and it can't be sustainable because minerals are not renewable. You know, so even if we say we are moving to lithium battery based energy uh, that is based on solar panels, uh, the lithium is a mined product. The copper is a mined product. And we, you know, the way we are consuming minerals at the moment, we are going to have shortages of very important strategic minerals uh, um, very soon. And there's going to be increasing conflict and war over minerals. The, 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 the conflict in Gaza is about oil, offshore oil. It's not really about Palestinians and Israelis. It's not really about uh, Zionists and, and Muslims. It's not really about uh, religion or anything like that. It's all about clearing the area so that big oil companies can move in there and take out the oil and gas that's off the coast of Gaza. You know, and so um, either we work out uh, a just transition that is not not based on war, and we see that with lithium, for example, there was a coup d'etat in Bolivia where, where Elon Musk wanted to get his hands on the lithium there, and he effected a right-wing overthrow of the left-wing government there, which didn't last long because the Bolivian people rejected that. But <laughs> increasingly, we see we see wars in mineral-rich areas such as the Congo, where um, you've got you you've got coltan, you've got cobalt, and you've got copper. All three very important minerals for the transition away from uh, uh, you know fossil fuel uh, energy towards a solar. And, and alternative energy. Um, and we see that in, in northern Mozambique, there's a conflict over gas and oil. Um, and we will see in the South African context, if we are not careful, that we can have a conflict over our copper. We can have a conflict also over our manganese, because manganese is also a very important mineral for alternative energy, for the manufacturing of batteries and things. And we've got 90% of the world's manganese in this country, but we are exporting it very rapidly. And if we are not careful, uh, it will also become depleted and we won't have anything with which to make a transition. Um, so the, the government's energy plan is based on large amounts of money from the EU and from the United States, the IMF and the World Bank that have been 
uh, pumped into South Africa to create huge, big solar farms. And the solar farms are all being set up in the Northern Cape, basically. Um, and there is a huge, big problem with, with, with this approach because the Northern Cape is sparsely populated. There are not many people there. The Northern Cape is also very far from the national energy grid. Um, the Northern Cape is also very far from the biggest consumer of energy in South Africa, which is Gauteng, whereas Mpumalanga is right next door to, uh, to Gauteng. The Northern Cape is very far away from it. Now, as the coal mines will eventually shut down because the European Union demand, is demanding that South Africa changes over into alternative energy, so uh, you know the coal mines will gradually grind to a halt. You will start finding... Uh, coal mining towns also dying and thousands of people being retrenched around coal mining towns. And so um, if you don't create the alternative energy hubs in Mpumalanga, you're going to sit with a province with massive unemployment suddenly and huge social and economic pro uh, problems. But I understand why the government wants to target the Northern Cape, because in the Northern Cape, it being sparsely populated, solar energy doesn't generate much jobs. And the other problem with solar energy, uh, you know, uh, is that um, in not creating in not creating many jobs, um, it will also not uh, be in a in 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 a place they locate they're locating it there so that it's not in a place where there will be community demands to participate because the, because of the, the the very sparse population of the Northern Cape, and so. Um, I think the Just Energy Transition Plan also is very directed at big companies, big companies having big solar farms and selling electricity to the population and excluding the population from the benefits, not only of employment, but also from the benefits of participating in manufacturing solar panels and also from the benefits of households generating energy to put back into the national grid and thereby overcoming the what I call energy apartheid in South Africa. By energy apartheid, I mean that rich people in the suburbs and so on can afford solar panels on their roof. They can generate their own energy. Uh, poor people will be, uh, you know, at the mercy of private companies that are producing solar energy from the Northern Cape. And it will be very expensive because we will have to create a new national grid to, to take that energy from the Northern Cape back to consumers where they are located. So people will, will be excluded from uh, energy uh, by the model of transition that the government is proposing at the moment. So David, is it a myth that transition energy or so-called green energy will end mining in South Africa and the environmental degradation that accompanies mining? No, I don't think that, that that alternative energy or green energy will end mining because reliant on mining. It will be reliant on manganese, it will be reliant on on lithium, it will be reliant on copper and cobalt. Um, you know, so mining will continue, but it will be for different minerals. It will no longer be for platinum, it won't be for gold and so on. It will be for a different Bouquet, a different mix of minerals uh, than 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 what was mined before. Uh, a lot of the government's uh, alternative energy plan also relates to gas, and so uh, they will promote a lot of fracking, especially in the Karoo and in the Free State and so on, to get at the gas that is contained, the methane gas that is contained uh, underground in in the South African context. Now. If you look at Valcom and Machabeng, the, the area of Valcom, Windows, West Virginia, and Allen Ridge, where uh, the Free State gold mines are, that area is very rich in gas. Uh, you will remember that a, a year ago, 23 mine workers died in a gas, Samazamas died in a gas explosion in one of the mines in Virginia, one of the old abandoned mines in, in Virginia. Now, they can repurpose the mines. They can repurpose the gold mines to produce gas in the Free State. So that towns like Valcom, Allen Ridge, Wood North West, and Virginia don't have to die. They can become producers of gas if they repurpose the mines. They don't have to issue new licenses for fracking because the tunnels and everything are already there underground. All you have to do is to extract the gas that is in abundance 
in those particular mines. Because it's a model that is not corporate friendly, the government won't be interested in that. Now, with regard to solar energy, if you solarize every township in South Africa, and I was in Deep Cliff in Soweto over the weekend, you know, there's about 70 Five percent, fifty to seventy-five percent of the roofs in Deep Deep Cliff are still asbestos, and asbestos was banned in two thousand and eight in South Africa. But unfortunately, the asbestos fund disappeared down Esmachashule's pocket, so the roofs, the asbestos that was supposed to be removed, was not removed. Now, if you replace the asbestos roofs in Soweto with solar panel roofs, the whole roof is a solar panel, then each household can become a generator of electricity and sell electricity back into the national grid. That will empower those households where there's very high levels of unemployment already. And, you know, the light that will be freely available, the electricity that will be freely available to those households can then be used to uplift those households in terms of education, but also in terms of small and medium economic enterprise activity. You know, each household, they have lots of mechanics there. You've got lots of electricians there. You've got lots of people with all kinds of skills that are unemployed at the moment in a place like Soweto, where if they have access to electricity, cheap electricity, they can actually then uplift themselves. And the children in those households can actually have uh, the necessary electricity and so on with which to study. You know, so a household can generate its own electricity and sell back to the national grid to supply industry and so on in the country if you turn the townships into solar farms. Instead of taking vast areas of land in the Northern Cape or the Karua and turning those into solar farms that belong to private corporations. And, you know, when the EU gives you money, they insist that you must give the contracts to EU companies. So they give South Africa five billion for the just transition, and then that five billion must be spent on uh, European electricity supply companies uh, uh, rather than to households in South Africa. Whereas if you create solar farms in townships and so on, uh, you can actually empower the people rather than the corporations. And that would be a far more just transition and a far more uh, inclusive transition. Now, also, we've got a lot of mine wasteland at the moment, polluted land caused by mining. Uh, th- that mine wasteland can be turned into solar farms, and usually they are next to township communities and so on. And the township communities can own those solar farms to generate an income for themselves. Uh, Valcom, for example, owes uh, ESCOM in excess of 10 billion rands in outstanding electricity bills. Now, if you convert the mine waste areas around Welcome into solar farms, uh, Welcome can pay off its bill to ESCOM and it can become a major generator of electricity. Um, the same with the coal mining towns when the coal mines eventually shut down. You can turn the coal wastelands and so on into solar farms and you can employ the local people in that particular area uh, on those solar farms, but also in factories and so on that produce solar uh, electricity. You know, that would be a just transition. A just transition would be saying, how do we transition away from fossil fuels towards uh, solar and altern- alternative energy in a manner that sees to it that the people who will become unemployed as a result of the decline in mining in those towns uh, become employed in the alternative energy sector? David, one can think about this plan in two ways, that it is a plan and it can be changed, that with adequate public participation and maybe less thought about the EU and contracting with big business and multinationals, that we still have an opportunity to look at how South African communities can engage with a just transition energy plan, and in many ways, views like yours, views like communities, views like communities from the Northern Cape that's actually quite worried about the environment and impact of indigenous communities' lives and the quality of life Mm -hmm. if mining, mining should continue in the same way. Can we now look at a different kind of energy plan where government take in consideration the environment and the needs of the people and the long-term future of South Africa, or is it too late? Is this plan cast in stone? Is there opportunities for public, public participation? Or is it a done deal? 
Well, I think that I participated in some of the Just Transition workshops that was actually sponsored by the very same EU. Um, and and I have also participated in investigations by journalists from Europe in South Africa to look at what is happening in terms of the transition in South Africa. And I can tell you that at the EU just transition workshops that were held in the area of Kempton Park a couple of years ago. Trade unions were there, NGOs were there, government officials were there, and so on. But ordinary community members were not there. And that's the first thing. The second thing is that they did not take very kindly to alternative points of view in those meetings, to the point where, you know, I, for example, was invited to one of those meetings and then never again. And, you know, if you speak to communities in Soweto, in Dipslut, in Tabong, in Yakalong, in Yagersfontein, or wherever, you know, mining occurred and people have been left destitute by uh, by mining and, and, and by also the closure of mining and so on, no one has ever spoken to them about the just transition and what it means. You know, it's a very, it's a very um, catchy phrase, just transition. But to me, it looks like it is just a transition from one uh, exploitative economy to another exploitative economy, rather than being just in the in 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 the sense of being legally and constitutionally just towards the rights of the people in South Africa. You know, so we don't want just a transition because that is what is happening now. We are just having just a transition from one corporate multinational corporation from one multinational corporation model to another multinational corporation model, which will be owned by foreigners in which a small group of people will have 27% shareholding and the vast majority will be excluded from ownership. You know, so there will be no public ownership. There will no be no opportunity for the commons, ordinary people uh, to participate in a meaningful manner in this thing. And so, you know, I don't hold out much hope. Do you think, it's too optimistic to think that energy changes transition will end energy poverty. No, it won't end energy poverty and it won't end energy apartheid, you know, which means the people in the suburbs will have access to an abundance of energy that they can install for themselves because they can afford it. And uh, people in townships and so on <coughs> who will pay through their next to private private suppliers of energy because the uh, public supplier is being dismantled at the moment. You know, so uh, the injustice will continue. Um, and the injustice, uh, you know, there will be uh, there will be kind of an overlap of race and class, but it will increasingly become a class issue, um, you know, with the poor being excluded and the wealthy uh, being included uh, in the transition. And that is basically the economic model that our government has decided on uh, since 1994, you know, that market model that says, um, you know, uh, let's leave it for every individual to compete for themselves uh, to, uh, to, 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 to succeed in this economy. And if they don't succeed, it's their own fault. You know, and that basically ignores the structural concentration of the economy in very few and powerful hands, you know, and which makes it very impossible for small people to participate. You know, small enterprises, for example, in South Africa, 80% of them fail within the first year of starting up. You know, and that is because they basically get no real meaningful support from government. They get no real meaningful support in the economy because they compete with very, very big global multinational corporations, uh, you know, in the retail sector, uh, in the wholesale sector, in the banking sector, in mining and in agriculture, you know. So um, um, uh, the 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 planners in our economy, our economy, are uh, are not really really concerned with the well-being of ordinary citizens. I know that the debate in South Africa around privatization of the mines and, to some extent, uh, land restitution is not really what government wants. They're not opening these debates and they continuously state that privatization is not on the cards. What are the alternatives? Because you are mentioning that only 27% will benefit and the rest of benefits will go to the multinationals. How can people 
start owning the resources of the country and benefiting from it. Well, you know, what we what we are trying to do at Benchmarks at a very small scale level is we are going into these old dying mining towns and we go into the townships and we do skills audits. So we we go with questionnaires from house to house asking people what skills they have and so on. Then after that, we analyze the skills audits and we try and help those communities to create uh business and economic units based on the skills that are available to them. So, for example, in Yakalong Township outside Allen Ridge, we uh, launched three cooperatives, one in agriculture, one in construction, and one in hospitality, based on the skills that we found there. <laughs> we we launched one in Yakasfontein based on agriculture. You know, um, so basically the message that we are trying to give to people is you have got skills. You don't have to wait for someone to come and give you a job. You can actually create your own uh, well-being by working together, you know, by standing together, by pooling what you have, by um, uh, interacting with the economy on your terms uh, as a startup. Now, you know, with a just transition in energy, for example, if a community has uh, a number of people that are in construction and in electronics, for example, e electricians and plumbers and, and bricklayers and so on, um, there should be an opportunity for them to be able to participate in such a transition in terms of, uh, you know, uh, getting the electricity into households and so on. But if you have the households owning the electricity, then those people with those skills can be even more valuable within those communities. You know, if you have a hospitality cooperative and it caters, for example, for government and other events, it needs to be able to cook. To be able to cook, it needs electricity. Now, if it has its own supply of electricity uh, that belongs to the people in that township, not to private companies, not to government, but it belongs to the people, to the households themselves, then um, you know they can they can meaningfully interact with 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 the economy. Um, the thing is that uh, if I was in the Department of Labor in government and in the Department of Economic Development, I would do skills orders all across the country. Remember, we're a small organization with very little money. Uh, we can intervene uh, in very small. Uh, uh, um, um, Ways We can't really cover the whole country. We don't have the resources to cover the whole country. We're 10 or 11 people in the Benchmarks Foundation. Um, and so uh, it's very difficult for us to be everywhere all the time, all at once. You know, And so uh, our pace can only be very slow. But if, but if I was in, in, in charge of a department of government, um, I would do skills audits right through the country. We hear that there's more than half a million graduates that are unemployed. Many of them are even engineers and electrical engineers and geologists and all kinds of other very high-level skills that are unemployed, sitting at home at the moment in the townships. Um, and we've come across them when, when we do our work as well, and when, when we do skills audits and so on uh, as well. Those people should not be unemployed. You know, those people should be involved in in in, in public uh, um, um, processes that deals with the challenges that are faced with the country. It's not that South Africa does not have work that needs to be done. You know, we need to fix our roads. We need to repair our hospitals. We need to maintain our schools and infrastructure. Um, we need to clean our towns and cities. Uh, we need to, uh, uh, you know, uh, we, we need to uh, uh, ensure that uh, infrastructure is maintained. We need to build dams. We need to uh, create grids and things like that. There's a lot of work that needs to be done in South Africa. But the private sector is not based on job creation. The private sector is based on the motive of profit. That's all that they want. They will want to make a profit. So, for example, in an agricultural cooperative, uh, a private sector farm will employ high levels of technology that will not be job creating. Uh, one one driver of a tractor takes away the work of 20 people who could have tilled the land by other means, for example. You know, so the cooperatives that we are working on in Yakasfontein and Yakalong and so on, we are recommending to the people there that let us not use uh, capital intensive technology. Let's use labor intensive technology so that more people can work 
rather than pure people working. Um, you know, and 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 uh, uh, the the loss of jobs and so on. Um, and and that is the approach that we should take. We should actually mobilize the people of South Africa in a way that uh, can involve them meaningfully in the in the economy um, um, based on what skills and experience they have. For example, in Yahashwantain, there are not many people who've got formal skills, but most of them have worked on farms and they, they know farming and agriculture very, very well. They're very good at growing their own food and vegetables and that sort of thing. And, you know, we should utilize that sort of thing by, by creating that cooperative that can supply um, uh, vegetables and so on to the local supermarket uh, where people are buying the vegetables and so on from or supplying milk to that supermarket or other agricultural produce. So it would require that, apart from the skills audit and creating the cooperative, transacting offtake agreements between local businesses and the cooperatives that are job creating in the area. So if there is to be construction, like in Yachesfontein, for example, with the houses that were destroyed, uh, a construction cooperative could easily build those houses. But the mining company simply went and got contractors from outside to come and reconstruct the houses. And the population whose houses were destroyed uh, are sitting there passively unemployed and watching how these houses are being rebuilt while uh, they themselves are still unemployed. So, David, once again, it is up to communities to create space for themselves to benefit from especially the energy transition. And as you've mentioned, other opportunities that may come around to not only have a job, but improve their quality of life. Yes, I think that we should work towards uh, social and economic development rather than economic growth. So when a person engages in work, they should be engaging in work to improve their quality of life as an individual, but also to improve the quality of life of the people around them. You know, So um, when I go into a job, I should not go into a job in competition with my community, in competition with other people, but rather in a manner that will uh, 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 raise the standard of living of everybody around me. You know, and, 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 and unfortunately, that model of, of economics is not being taught in our schools. That model of economics is not being pushed by, by, by the media. Um, that model of economics is not being uh, 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 popularized among people. And that is really what should be happening. At the moment, all that we are thinking about is celebrities and everyone wants to become a celebrity. Everyone wants to become a billionaire and so on. And it's impossible. You know, that economic model of what uh, Mantashe calls the cream rising to the top is a nonsense model because it actually leaves a thin layer of cream at the top and everything below it is in misery. Anything else you would like to add? Well, I really think that we need to get into a discussion all over the country to change the narrative. We need to change the way uh, we are thinking as a society, the way our government is thinking as, as, as a government, and the way our government is responding to the needs of the people. The government really is an institution that should belong to the people. It should not be an institution that is in the pocket of big corporations. And we need to actually recapture our government for ourselves. Thank you, David, for a very informative and insightful interview, and good luck with the work that you are doing. Tanzania, Tanzania. 
Zanzibaria. Karibu ni mwone mambo ya Zanzibari. Zanzibari ni nchi amani, wote mnakaribishwa. Hey. 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 Baba hey. Indigenous Rights Radio, because knowledge is power.